that we have now faced the worst economic contraction in American history. More than 30 million Americans have filed for unemployment insurance. Almost a million people a week have filed for unemployment insurance. So I wanna thank all of you for participating. This is a bad milestone for millions of families across the country. It's the date that the Federal Emergency Unemployment Compensation established in the CARES Act expires. And almost 26 million workers will lose two thirds of their weekly unemployment benefits. Now for our witnesses this morning and how grateful we are for you offering up personal testimony, but a this reminder that is people being that recorded. you're participating with on the Ways and Means Committee, we wrote that unemployment insurance bill. That's an essential to understand. And the supplemental part of it was extremely important because we foresaw that the recovery would be slower than anticipated. People would simply need that uh, allocation. Sadly, Senate Republicans have refused to do the same. In the HEROES Act, which we passed two and a half months ago, we would have continued the supplemental unemployment insurance through January of next year, where we would have a better analysis of what recovery would look like. So for 10 weeks, they have not done anything in the Senate and put it squarely on the shoulders of the Republicans in the Senate that they have understated the nature of the challenge of the COVID crisis. This is about a pandemic. This is not about malfeasance. And reminder, as I try to tell everybody in my opening statements, you cannot quit your job to get unemployment insurance. So that argument needs to be put by the wayside very quickly. So Ways and Means Democrats have convened this session. We've heard from constituents are desperate to get this aid to continue. Every day, more phone calls and letters pour in. Americans need this benefit to put food on the table, to afford their bills, and to pay their rent. I'm very grateful to the individuals from across the country who have joined us to tell their stories. We'll be hearing from nine people who will share how COVID has affected their lives and how important the $600 payments in supplementary income are to their survival. My colleagues and I appreciate your courage and your candor during these frightening times. Next, I'm gonna turn things over to Worker and Family Support Subcommittee Chairman Danny Davis, who will lead the portion of the program when we hear from the Ways and Means members as they share the stories they've heard from their constituents. I've spoken to countless Western Mass residents about the lifeline that this supplemental income has provided. One Springfield resident gave me permission to share her story with you today. Martha is a constituent of mine who has been extraordinarily challenged in recent times. In 2019, she lost one of her children to cancer. In March of this year, a fire destroyed her home. Before the pandemic, she offered house cleaning and nanny services. She's a single mom. She now says that the end of these emergency benefits could cause her to lose the home she now lives in. When I hear stories like Martha's, I cannot fathom how Senate Republicans can insist on cutting this benefit. So we're gonna hear and share your stories, and hopefully by elevating these voices, we can add more pressure for action to be taken and for lives to be served. So first, we're gonna hear from Tia Ferguson, who joins us from Ohio. Thank you to the Ways and Means Committee for inviting me to speak today. My name is Tia Ferguson and I'm from Ohio. I am one of millions of unemployed Americans. I fell in love with teaching when I started substitute teaching four years ago. What I thought would be a job that offered the flexibility to work and take care of my children put me on the path of finding and fulfilling my purpose. The COVID-19 has not only paused my ability to provide for my family as a substitute teacher, but halted my ability to expand the enrollment of my private academy that started in July 2019. And as much as I want to be back at work in my public teaching position, I'm uncertain if I can work safely. And since my employer has announced earlier this week that the academic year will resume fully online, to date, I have no certainty that my teaching position is still needed. America is tired. We're weary of this plague that has taken more than 150,000 of our own. This death is exhausting. And when we mourn death, we often mourn what we do not know. 
but I know death all too well. In December 2019, I gave birth to my six-month-old stillborn son after battling an unknown infection. While in labor with him, I fought to stay alive as the infection raged through my body, causing my temperature to rise and leaving me too weak to get up from my bed. I am thankful that my nurse repeatedly cleaned up my backside as I soiled myself nearly every 20 minutes for over an hour. My living three children are glad that I survived. But when I told them that I was mandated to teach in person, they looked at me like I would not be so lucky to survive the threat of death again. I have underlying health conditions that makes me susceptible to the worst that COVID-19 gives us. And it makes it impossible for me to work in the jobs that are hiring right now. So much of what this virus brings is uncertain. And this uncertainty is exhausting. That is why we are looking to you. We are looking to our fellow citizens that we have entrusted to have our best interest in heart to lead us out of this plague. So let me make this point clear. We do not want pandemic unemployment assistance. We need pandemic unemployment assistance. And there lies the huge difference. Extending the 600 a week benefit means that my children do not have to lose their childhood home within months of losing their baby brother. It means that within a global health crisis, the water is still running in our home so that we can wash our hands, stay clean, and do our part to curtail the spread of this virus. We are looking to you to be good citizens, sound leaders that will give us a measure of certainty in these most uncertain times. Like I teach my children and the children I have been entrusted to care for, be prudent by doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason. COVID-19 has given us its worst. Take charge of this virus by doing what is best. Thank you. Jacqueline? All right, I want to start out by thanking the Ways and Means Committee for taking the time to listen to our stories and letting us have a voice. My name is Jacqueline Lopez and I'm a dental hygienist from Arizona. I was furloughed on March 17th and I started receiving unemployment insurance in the first week of April. The $600, which is less than half of what I make, has helped my family, my husband, my toddler, myself, with the money, I'm able to pay for our groceries, medical bills, car payments, utilities, mortgage, and necessary items for our toddler like diapers and healthy food items like milk, fruits, and vegetables. Without the $600, my family's budget would be extremely difficult to manage. It would be difficult to pay our mortgage. I'm also pregnant and which will incur a lot of medical bills when our baby is born in a couple of weeks. We'll struggle to pay for the necessary items with one more mouth to feed. The $600 has also helped keep my family and I safe. During the nature, or due to the nature of my job, I am already at a very high risk for contracting COVID-19. As a dental hygienist, I am in direct contact with my patients' mouths, which create aerosols. And if a patient is sick with COVID-19, even if they don't have symptoms, the virus can linger in the air for hours at a time, which can infect dental staff or any patient seen after them. Dental offices are not equipped and have never been equipped to deal with an airborne infectious disease, whereas hospitals are equipped with negative pressure rooms. Dental professionals need the highest level of PPE, such as the N95 masks, gowns, and face shields, and there is a severe shortage. Reusing contaminated or improper PPE puts both clinicians and patients at a very high risk for contracting COVID-19. OSHA states, only patients, and I quote, only patients needing urgent and emergency dental procedures should be seen during the pandemic. All elective procedures should be postponed. Limiting service services will help control dental workers' possible exposure to sick patients, end quote. The CDC also states if there is inadequate or improper PPE, only emergency dental treatment should be performed. 
Currently, dental offices nationwide are not required to, per, to report COVID-19 positive cases within staff members or patients. There are many reports of dental professionals and patients getting infected. And in Arizona, coronavirus cases are still growing. OSHA, dental boards, and health departments are aware of the risks and issues and yet have taken steps to protect dental professionals and patients. Without the $600, I would be working in a dental office in an unsafe environment without proper or adequate PPE, putting myself, my baby's life, my family's life, and my patient's lives in danger, which is going against my professional code of ethics. I may not be able to pay for hospital bills when the baby comes and necessary items that the newborn baby will need. Workers like me that have unsafe working conditions need the $600 extended until this pandemic is over. Thank you for your time. Thank you much, Jacqueline. Now let me ask Cassandra Minan from Missouri to share her story. Cassandra. Thank you to the Ways and Means Committee for asking me to join today. My name is Cassandra and I am from Missouri. On March 17, 2020, I was furloughed from my job with traveling. My husband and I were worried about paying our mortgage and other bills, so I was relieved when Congress passed the CARES Act. The CARES Act added an additional $600 a week to $280 a week maximum unemployment, which meant we could pay our bills. The travel industry was hit very hard and has continued to with new layoffs and furloughs and after In June, I was informed my furlough would be a layoff until July 1st, 2020, and that I would have medical insurance until the end of July. Thankfully, my husband still is working full time and I can get on his insurance, but that will cost over $600 a month, which we cannot afford on the $280 for the The travel industry is not expected to come back to 2019 levels for at least three to four years. I have dozens of friends in the travel industry and less than five of them are still employed. I have revised my resume four times and I've applied to over 350 jobs over the last four months. I have not been. I have applied to everything that would cover our bills. The jobs just are not there. My husband became a U.S. citizen in March of 2019 and about two years ago we finally achieved our dream of owning a home. Now we may lose our home if the $600 is not spending. Where are we supposed to turn if Congress fails to extend the $600 week benefit? My parents are both blue collar workers in rural Missouri and have worked very hard for everything they have, but they do not make enough to cover our mortgage as well as their own bills. My in laws are retired and live in India, and they are not able to help us either as their pension. We have paid taxes for decades, and we need this $600 to spend on us during this difficult time, so we are all on our team. Octavia Milliam, who is joining us from New York. Octavia. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Members of the Ways and Means Committee, and thank you for the opportunity to share my story. My name is Artavia Milliam. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I'm a member of Local 1102 of the Retail Wholesale Department Store Union, UFCW. I've worked in retail over 12 years, most of them with the same company. Because of the pandemic, I was furloughed in mid-March and have been on unemployment since. At this time, I live with my mother, my 12-year-old niece, and 11-year-old nephew. My mother received disability because she was injured at work a few years back and helps with some of our expenses. But I'm responsible for ensuring we all have a roof over our heads and food on our table. The federal pandemic unemployment insurance, the $600, has really helped during this time. And I thank you for making it possible for me to have this additional support. I know some people think it's too much and that people should not earn more on unemployment than they did when they worked. What those people don't understand is how much more expensive it has been during the pandemic. And I was already living check to check. The kids have medical expenses. My nephew has to see his regular doctor and a heart doctor every month. Both kids have to see a mental health counselor every month and my niece has a monthly appointment with the dentist for her braces. All of those require co-payments. Plus we have co-payments for medication. 
These all add up. And that does not include cost of getting to and from appointments. Also, before the pandemic, I may have spent two to three hundred dollars a month on food. But now with everyone at home all day with two growing kids eating three meals a day and snacks, I spend two to three hundred dollars every two weeks. Supermarkets haven't had the sales on anything. Everything has been so expensive everywhere. And for us, where we live, it's even more so because I live in New York City housing in a gentrified neighborhood, which means our supermarkets are catering to higher income residents. I take a car service to shop at a different neighborhood to save on groceries, but even the car service is more expensive because of high demand. I wish I could take public transportation, but I care for an elderly mother and a nephew with a heart condition. Mass transit in New York City is crowded. We hear every day of how transit workers are getting sick and falling to COVID. I can't take the risk of being exposed or forcing my family to take a bus and potentially killing the people I love. With the federal unemployment ending this week, I am worried I have been looking for things to cut from our budget it's hard when you're already living your life on bare bones. We pay for internet, cable, telephone, rent, and food, maybe some other essentials. My only option is to cut off the cable and have the, everyone find other forms of entertainment and keep up with the news. I can't cut off the internet because the kids need it for school. Going back to work full time is not an option for me right now. My store isn't opening anytime soon. I work in a mall and those aren't safe to open yet. Plus the kids going back to school remotely, I can't work full time. My nephew, my nephew has special needs and my mother can't handle his kid with her disability. He needs additional support to learn. It was hard to finish this last school year during, doing it remotely. It felt like I was going back to school, but harder because I also had to figure out how things are taught these days. I don't know when my store will reopen. With the economy the way it is and retail being slow right now, I can't be relocated to a different store where I would at least keep my seniority and my pay rate, maybe for the holidays because it will pick back up. But even if I find another job with another company, I still will have to go back part-time. I already know that there is no way I can survive earning two to $300 a week on minimum wage. Our government must continue to support working people. We aren't looking for charity. We just want to survive until we get through the crisis. I am proud of being a retail worker and enjoy my job. I look forward to the day when I can return to work. Right now, we don't need to rush to work in unsafe working conditions. We need protection and we need our government to guide us through this difficult time and help us to stay hold while until we can get back to work safely. Thank you. Thank you, Arcavia. And I want you to know that I am a lifetime member of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union. It was good testimony. Next, uh, let's talk to uh, and hear from Nora Bashtail, who lives in Georgia. Nora. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nora Mashtayel, and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a single mom to an amazing 12 year old son named Ennis. I'm also a proud member of Moms Rising, and I want to thank Chairman Neal and the Ways and Means Community uh, Committee for lifting up the real experiences of families during this listening session. Um, over the decade, uh, the last decade plus, I've built a career in the restaurant industry. Uh, before the pandemic, I was working hard both as, uh, as a server in both an upscale restaurant in uh, the Buckhead area of Atlanta, as well as I had um, a, a job at the Neiman Marcus in store cafe. Um, I do have two degrees, but I need a flexible work to keep, take care of my son. He has a Down syndrome and also speech apraxia issues. And so we have um, pretty much for his entire life been um, attending regular private speech services. Uh, occupational service. Um, he was getting physical therapy when he was younger as well. Um, then in mid-March, of course, the restaurants had to close and I was immediately furloughed from both my jobs. Uh, soon thereafter, I was permanently laid off from the Buckhead restaurant. Uh, I'm still furloughed from Nima Marcus, uh, but they just recently filed for bankruptcy, bankruptcy. So I am worried that they may not be reopening the actual restaurant anytime soon since that's a 
a different aspect of the overall uh, profit of the store. Um, thankfully, Neiman Marcus has been filing unemployment claims for everyone, um, all the employees, which has helped me out since you know being furloughed. Um, the $600 a week boost has been essential uh, for our family. Um, money is still tight. I did actually take an income cut, um, you know, based on what we're receiving, you know, with the unemployment insurance. Um, but these funds have obviously allowed us to keep up mostly with bills uh, while keeping my son um, adjusted with going to online school and so forth. Um, and he will be changing school again soon because we've had to bend to the unknowns of what was going to come, you know, today. Um, so I've had to make the tough decision to give up our apartment and move back in to um, our parents' home, which is about an hour away. So I have had to decide. I had to make the decision to put him in an online public school that didn't differentiate where we were living, um, and pull him out for the second time in the last couple of years. That he's had to make changes, being in a new educational environment in addition to his academic challenges. Um, so now that the boost is ending. You know, obviously it is terrifying. Um, and I've had to make a decision to, for our life in Atlanta to come to an end for now. Um, I don't know what I would do without having that to fall back on. Fewer job opportunities outside of the city in Georgia. Um, and I've also had to struggle to keep up with my student loans. I have one um, predatory private loan that was through Perkins, but they're not associated with the Department of Education. And so they felt that they weren't, um, they didn't have any responsibility to, you know, people going through the pandemic. And so that's gone into collections and my credit dropped 130 points from that. Um, so, you know, looking for jobs, opportunities right now are few and far between. Um, I wouldn't feel safe right now, and I feel for some of the people who have had to start back in restaurant jobs because it is so risky. People are getting sick. They're being exposed, and um, I'm just blessed right now that I'm not having to expose myself or my mother, who's 72 and a cancer survivor, to that right now. Um, I do wish more policymakers prioritize the needs of families like ours. Um, working moms are juggling a lot right now. I need more support. We have to make the decision of whether or not to stay home with our families, you know, or be out at risk and risking our health and our lives. That's really not a decision that any American should have to make right now. It's beyond our control. So we need the Republicans in Congress to do the right thing and extend the federal boost to unemployment, as well as provide financial relief so that we can stay afloat until this is, you know, and we're on the other side. So. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Nora. And now we'd like to hear from Mary Prophet, who lives in Kentucky. Mary? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, good morning, and thank you for listening to an old Kentucky girl. I, um, I have a, a tiny bit different story in that, um, Several years ago, I'm, as you can see, I'm seasoned. I have gray hair and um, I'm almost 64 years old. I'm also a single mother of a 12 year old with special needs. Um, I adopted this cute little brown thing years ago. I've had him since he was two years old. Um, and, and he is on the autism spectrum. My parents were aging. Um, aren't we all, but my parents were aging and my mother um, four or five years ago started showing signs of Alzheimer's and my dad has chronic lymphatic leukemia. So I left the job that I was working because the demands of that job were 60 to 80 hours a week on um, a salary of like $12,500 a year in the, the the job that I had was being in charge of 10,000 medications a month for adults with disabilities. I could not at that time pay attention to my parents or my son or myself or ensure that I would not make a medical mistake, um, which would eventually have cost somebody their lives. So I stepped down from that job and if you can think that $12,500 is 
you know, a step down, I literally stepped down to a restaurant job, which means that it's part time, no health insurance, no paid time off. Um, Kentucky's never actually ever been a panacea of wealth as far as um, jobs go, but it was a step that I was willing to make and I do not regret spending the last nine months of my mother's life helping take care of her. My dad is 87 and still has chronic lymphatic leukemia. My son still has special needs. So the reason for my step down was obviously not um, for income reasons, but for you know spiritual and emotional needs for my family. Um, and it, that was a sacrifice I was willing to make. In, um, and I had worked at that restaurant almost three years. It sort of had a cult following because I have a, a pretty large personality. And in Mar on March 25th, we had already closed down the dining rooms to, um, you know, open, open dining uh, services. And it was carry out and... Uh, curbside only. The hours were cut significantly. All of the teenagers who, who worked in the restaurant were let go and I was held on to because I was a valued employee. But as you can see with my gray hair, I'm quite the risk for COVID-19. And due to um, whatever politicization of masks versus no masks, um, working in that restaurant became an increasing risk for me. And so I was laid off March the 25th and with the assurances that I would have a job when things calmed down. Um, I didn't cause the pandemic. I can't control it and, and I certainly can't cure it. So I have been home with my special needs son since March and due to problems in Kentucky with their unemployment system, I have not even gotten the $600 um, pandemic assistance. So since May the 15th, I have had no income other than um, making masks and selling masks for $20 a piece. That's how I've been feeding my son and myself, and that's how we've been keeping safe. Um, it's pretty disheartening to be this age and to hear um, Republican senators say that we're making bank or we're lazy or we don't want to go to work because I have never not worked in my life. Um, I, I would challenge anybody because I hand sew the masks. I would challenge anybody in, in the House of Representatives or the Senate to try to live off of $60 a week. And I'm grateful that I own my own home, um, but I could lose it. I'm one hospital bill away from losing my home. Um, I'm barely keeping the lights on and I'm barely feeding my 12 year old. And anybody who's ever had a 12 year old knows that they have a tapeworm. It's, you know, it's an ongoing feed me, feed me, feed me. Um, I would challenge Mitch McConnell to live off of what I'm making currently. And I have contacted him for the last 34 years and never gotten anything but a form letter. Um, it's disheartening to reach out to politicians and, and not have them hear me. So I am more than grateful that you guys are at least listening to me. And I hope that um, whatever comes of this, that for the record, none of us unemployed people are excited about being home for five months. And, and it looks now, it looks like with the, there's a spike in Kentucky. It looks like there is not any time any soon that we will safely be able to return to work. Uh, so I thank you for your time today and whatever, Whatever anybody can do to help this old lady from Kentucky, I would be more than appreciative. Thank you, Mary. Now we're going to hear from a fellow Massachusetts resident, Alan Siegel. Alan joins us from native Massachusetts, which is about five miles from Springfield. Yeah, and about 20 miles from Boston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's a pleasure and an honor to I'll be talking to the uh, members of the Ways and Means Committee. And uh, as Chairman Neal said, my name is Alan Siegel and I do live in Natick, Massachusetts. And I've been lucky in the sense of my career. I was a sportscaster for 23 years at a Boston radio station. I got laid off in 2008 
And I say this because it's going to build the foundation for what I have to tell you. It took me two years to get a job after that. And I went through my savings, went through my 401, just trying to survive and actually develop some debt. I then in 2010 was able to hook on with uh, a network and that was part time, about three or four shifts a week. And then they shifted their whole dynamic in 2017, cutting my shifts to one. So I basically was left with nothing. So a friend of mine um, was a member of one of the rideshare people and he suggested that. And I actually joined one of the rideshare companies and started to work full time for them, uh, creating about 50 or 60 hours a week, a lot of hours on the road, but I was able to make a living on it. And, able to pay my bills and keep the bill collectors from my front door. Uh, I'd done that for three years and around March 1st of this year, uh, I started to notice, of course, with everything going on with the pandemic uh, information starting to file in, that the rides were starting to lessen here in the Boston area. And right around March, I picked somebody up at Logan Airport here in Boston, got into a conversation with that person and found out that person uh, had come through the terminal without being checked. And the reason I mention that is because that person was from Italy. And right then and there, Italy was a very hot spot in the world. And here I was exposed to somebody from Italy and who knows if they were carrying the disease or not. Uh, around March 15th, um, I was talking to my doctor of over 30 years. And I'll mention at this point, I, am di I have diabetic. My doctor told me that at this point, I am too susceptible for COVID. Um, being 67 years old uh, and also with, the, with diabetes. And he said, you've got to get off the road. You, you, get, you catch this and you can be in serious trouble. So at that point, I got off the road, lived off my savings. Thank you to you people, because on March 27th, we had the CARES Act. And thanks to Governor Charlie Baker here in Massachusetts, he really went fast. And for gig workers like myself, he was able to put the uh, motion, uh, the things into motion so that on April 21st, Massachusetts was able to have gig workers go into the PUA uh, and I was able to apply for benefits and I got uh, the benefits, the $600 plus the minimum for Massachusetts with 267. And even at then it was 62% and asked before taxes of what I was making uh, and able to make, you know, riding full, driving full time. If I lose that 600, my percentage that I get goes down to 19% and that's before taxes. If you take the taxes out, which I have to, because I don't want to pay taxes, you know, in, in April and have to pay. Um, so I take it out. That'll come down to 8% of what I could make. And with that, I'm going to have to go back into my, you know, be, the, as I mentioned, the debt because I was laid off twice in nine years. So I'm going to have to go for just on that and hopefully, you know, my savings will last a little bit and I'm able to keep the bill collectors out and, and, and keep up with my bills. But it's no fun to get calls from bill collectors. And I consider myself lucky in some respects for some of the stories I heard this, this morning so far, Mary's especially. And it, it I, I, just, I represent a good number of people. I, my doctor has given me a letter and said he does not want me driving. He said, you know, you, you, it's, you're taking your life in your hands. So the question I have, and I'm scared of it, if I have to, if people come after me money-wise, do I go back to driving and put my life on my hands? I'm scared to make that choice. Because tell you the truth, I like living and I want to keep living. And if the Republicans in the Senate and the House don't understand that we're not out here collecting money just for the sake of being unemployed, we need it. We need it to survive. We need it to make choices so we can live. You know, I just wish that they could hear these stories and, and understand where we're coming from. And it's, it's you know, I could go on, but now I'm starting to get a little emotional. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, but but, but thank you for able to, to talk to you people. Thank you, Alan. Now we'd like to hear from Allegra Troiano, who joins us from Wisconsin. Allegra. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, Chairman Neal. Thank you to the Ways and Means Committee for inviting me to testify today. My name is Allegra Troiano, and I am from Wisconsin. Until the shutdown, I was a center director for an ELS Language Center in Milwaukee, a school which trains international students in English for graduate and undergraduate programs. I have worked in the field of international education for 40 years. According to NAFSA, the Association of International Educators, 
International students in the US contributed nearly $41 billion to the national economy in the 2018-19 academic year. On March 16th, as the shutdown was looming and schools were closing, we adjusted to the pandemic by conducting online classes, managing students' stress, advising students how, if even possible, uh, they could get back to their countries, and communicating with our headquarters on students' classes, enrollment projections, and challenges with the whole system. Due to poor enrollment projections for the following months, about 1,500 of our employees across the U.S. were notified in mid-April that our headquarters was laying off all but a few skeletal staff on May 1st. Myself and my staff were all laid off. We still don't know when we can open up safely. Uh, all is guided by the transmission of this virus. As of now, my language center will remain closed at least until January. The uncertainty about my job is entirely due to mismanagement of this pandemic by President Trump and Republicans in Congress. If you were a parent of an international student who is wanting to study in the U.S., would you allow your child to come to the, this country when the pandemic was raging? Wouldn't you look at the numbers, 46,000 in one day, and tell your child to hold off until COVID was under control, until there was a vaccine, or suggest going to another country that had better managed this virus? All seven of my teachers, my two admin staff, and myself have relied on the $600 to pay our monthly bills. My unemployment payments, including the 600, total $825 per week. That allows me to pay my mortgage, my utilities, my car payments, my food, and $609 payment to COBRA. Without that additional $600 per week, I will only receive $225, which won't even cover half my mortgage. All seven of my teachers, oh, I'm sorry, um, None of us asked to be laid off. None of us want to be sitting at home waiting for this pandemic to die down. I was offended when top officials suggested that I look for another job. My whole career has been in international education. I love my job, but I don't see it coming back anytime soon. Even if I wanted to find another job, I would be competing with millions of people seeking employment for very few jobs. And both my age, 64 and my high risk status complicate my ability to find something else. I feel that I can speak comfortably for all the international educators spread across the United States. Our jobs are not returning until this pandemic subsides or when there is a vaccine. Please help us get through this by voting to continue the $600 weekly unemployment payments. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Electra. Now we're going to hear from Magdalena Valiente from Florida. Magdalena. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Good morning, Chairman, and thank you to the Ways and Means Committee for inviting me today. My name is Magdalena Valiente. I live in Fort Lauderdale, uh, Florida. I immigrated from Argentina in 1986 to go to school uh, for the music industry. Um, I'm a, I, I had a student visa at the time, and I went to NYU in New York. I study um, music business. By the time I had two children, I graduated from NYU in 1993, and I became a tour manager for hundreds of bands. I built my business with a lot of hard work, endless hours, no sleep, always on a plane flying to my next destination. I worked mainly in the Latin music uh, industry. Worked with Shakira, Ricky Martin, Luis Miguel, Mana, Juan Gabriel, just to name a few in my business. On March 11, 2020, I was told that due to COVID-19, live events will be postponed until further notice. Now, my industry is completely shut down. We cannot do live shows until it's safe. And no one knows when that will be. And all of the promoters, not just me, I speak for everyone in my industry that does not have a job and is suffering. I adore what I do, working in entertainment, music, and tours, what I love the most after my children. I have a passion to what I do because it brings happiness to the world. I knew that if I wanted to switch careers into an entire new industry after building this business for 30 years, it's not easy for me. I am a cancer survivor. I had breast cancer twice. I also had heart surgery. So I'm a high, 
risk of being in any type of job out there. Um, bottom line is I'm now 52. I have four children. Uh, my youngest one who's studying to be an engineer. And if I stop getting the $600 payment, I will not be able to feed my child. I will not be able to pay my rent. I will not be able, to, I will pretty much be homeless, uh, which is heartbreaking because I've been working on my business for over 30 years. I worked very hard to build this career. I'm pretty well known in the industry and I adore what I do. I never not worked. Um, it's very, very difficult. So I'm really begging you um, to help us continue the, with this so we can get through it. When it's safe for me to go to work, I'd be the first one <laughs> conducting shows with, with all my colleagues. And thank you so much for taking this time to listen to me. And I appreciate everything you do for our country. And please, I ask you to help me and my child make it. Thank you, Magdalena. That testimony was very important from all of you who participated. Now we're gonna hear from members of the Ways and Means Committee who have joined the conversation. They're gonna share the stories that they have heard from their own constituents and why this is necessary to continue the supplement as it relates to unemployment compensation. You don't have and to share. A reminder, 31 million Americans have now applied for unemployment compensation. I'm gonna turn this over now to Chairman Danny Davis you could not have a better or more sincere advocate on this very issue. He understands the lifeline and he has pushed hard within the committee and on the floor of the House to extend this supplemental income, which we think is critical. Chairman Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you not only for this hearing, but also for your extraordinary leadership of the Ways and Means Committee. I think that you have been extremely effective and it is indeed a pleasure to work with you and other members of the committee. You know, as I listened to the witnesses, I thought of my parents who taught me as I was growing up to try and live by the golden rule. And that is to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And so I think of our Republican colleagues and ourselves who have the security of our jobs. We work every day. We can expect to get a paycheck at the beginning of the month. We've got health insurance benefits and we have a level of security. And yet my colleagues on the other side are unwilling to provide the same kind of security for the citizens of America where millions of people on today are losing their unemployment benefits. And so I say it's not only a sad day for America, but it is indeed a shameful day. It ought to be a shameful day for the Republican leadership in the White House, the Republican leadership in the Senate. And so I say shame on you. President Trump, shame on you, Leader Mitch McConnell. But it's so good to hear the stories of people, people who are affected in a very serious way. And I wanna read one of those stories. I'm gonna read the one from Chicago, Illinois, my hometown, the people that I represent. I want to read a story from Paulette, who lives in the city of Chicago. Before she was able to secure the enhanced unemployment benefits, she wrote, I've never applied for unemployment before the pandemic. I've been furloughed, furloughed from my position as a pediatric art therapist at a hospital in Cook County due to the virus. I was laid off on March 15th. I am a freelance therapist and my application has been put on hold for review. I've had no income the past two months. I have two children and my son will be attending college next year. I have only a very low savings left to live on. And so I asked the question, how am I supposed to provide for my family? 
the stress is beginning to influence my entire life. Well, we don't want people to have that kind of stress and that kind of suffering. And that is why the Democrats have passed the HEROES Act. That's why we've decided in the House that we would extend benefit to the millions of Americans that uh, need our help, need our consideration, and need for us to show to them that we too believe in the golden rule. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Now I'd like to hear from Congressman Mike Thompson from California. Mike, are you there? Thank you, uh, Chairman Davis. I uh, appreciate it very much. Thanks for doing this. Uh, Chairman Neal, thank you for facilitating this. And many thanks to the witnesses who came out to share their stories with us. And um, Danny, I, I agree with you 100% on the golden rule. Sadly, some of our friends on the other side have a different definition of that golden rule. They think uh, the people with the most gold makes the rules and it should benefit them. And that's uh, a sad state for the rest of us. Um, I think it's important to point out that uh, we, on this, we Democrats in this committee understand the situation that folks are dealing with. And that's why over two months ago, we passed the HEROES Act to extend, in part, to extend these benefits to make sure that people could make ends uh, meet. Uh, sadly, the Senate for two and a half months ignored it completely, didn't deal with it, didn't show any willingness to, uh, to negotiate. And then yesterday they left for the week uh, to, uh, without, doing, without taking any action. It was selfish, uh, it was unexplainable, and it was mean. Uh, it hurts people, and in addition to that, it hurts more than people that are just unemployed. It hurts the economy in our country and across the uh, across every one of our districts. I've heard from folks in my district and hospitality workers, independent contractors, business folks, everybody about how important uh, this is. One of my constituents from Sonoma County was the primary breadwinner for her family and her full-time job as a hotel chef provided her husband and three-year-old child with health care insurance. So uh, when that when she lost that job, uh, she had to buy that health insurance uh, out of pocket. Her premium price uh, for a family of three was over $1,000 per month. And uh, so I don't think folks understand the full reach of the problem uh, that uh, people are experiencing. Uh, a constituent from Napa told me that she saved for 10 years so they could buy their first home. And that uh, together with her husband, they work in the wine community and due to the current crisis, uh, have been laid off. Now with a new mortgage and a young child, they rely on enhanced benefits to make ends meet. Without the extra $600 of enhanced benefits, she'll be unable to cost uh, cover the cost of her everyday living experience uh, expenses, and that's not uh, she, that's not somebody getting rich on this. It's allowing her to barely make ends meet. I heard from an independent contractor uh, whose business is uh, temporarily shut down, and uh, any uh, change to this uh, these benefits is going to hurt him uh, and his family. Uh, so it just goes on and on and on. And I think we need to point out this new uh, Yale University uh, study that found that workers with more generous jobless benefits, uh, like the $600 additional uh, benefit, did not experience larger unemployment declines when their benefits took effect, and that they have returned to their previous jobs at a similar rate as others who don't have enhanced benefits. So I'm, I'm sure there's some folks who would rather get the extra money than go back to a low paying job. Uh, but the uh, studies show that the, the data shows that this isn't a, uh, a problem. So uh, we need to make sure that we get this passed 
Uh, Chairman Davis, you've been a great advocate uh, on this issue and, and many others that affect uh, folks who are, who are working Americans. I'm proud to serve with you on the committee and I stand with you uh, in, uh, in making sure that we address this very serious shortcoming. Uh, you yield back to balance my time. Danny, you're muted. You're muted, Danny. from Representative Earl Blumenauer and what folks are talking about in Oregon. I appreciate your leadership in this critical area at this critical time. And likewise, Chairman Neal has been focused like a laser uh, and identify strongly with what Mike Thompson just said. Again, members of this committee find ourselves in a familiar place. We've done our job. And unfortunately, even though we've passed legislation to help reduce the impact of COVID-19 on vulnerable Americans, the Trump administration and the Senate refuses to act. 10 weeks later, Republicans are peddling pseudo economics that have been discredited by real economists who've quantitatively demonstrated additional unemployment compensation does not result in lower rates of people returning to work. Congressman Thompson just cited an additional study. The additional $600 a week has acted as a lifeline for jobless Americans, enabled them to stay in their homes, put food on the table, and pay for other expenses like health care. In fact, the additional $600 a week to millions of people has also led to increased spending that has supported nearly 3 million jobs. At a time when we want to support employment, this unemployment spending helps prevent other unemployment and help is part of the comeback. The CBO estimates that the extension will increase economic output through the rest of the year. Even in my home state of Oregon, which consistently ranks in the top 10 benefit amounts, people are still worried about what they will do without additional compensation. One of my constituents, Ian from Portland, exemplifies the need for this benefit. He's been a bartender for eight years. He's worked tirelessly to build valuable skills and secure a job at a well-established bar where he made $62,000 a year. Four months ago, Ian was laid off. He was recently told that the earliest he will be hired back is December of this year. The additional $600 a week in federal aid has made this pandemic manageable, allowing Ian to continue putting food on the table, paying his mortgage. Now, however, he faces extreme uncertainty without additional compensation. He has left the decision of look, working, looking for work in a competitive field with few employment opportunities, restarting his career with little chance of making a comparable salary, or selling his home and finding a more affordable place to live. This is an intimidating task in one of America's most livable cities. In Portland, bars and restaurants are the bedrock of our culture and our economy. Professionals like Ian maintain our city's livability. Chairman Davis, you've waxed eloquent about what difference restaurants mean in your community of Chicago. He deserves to maintain financial security and eventually continue the profession he's worked so hard to extend in. 31 million people have applied for unemployment. Most have never before been on unemployment. People love their jobs. They want to work. We heard about one of our witnesses dealing with live music. The food industry, particularly independent restaurants, are devastated why we've introduced the Restaurants Act. The Senate and the Trump administration can't afford to delay any longer. They need to come to the negotiation table, expand pandemic unemployment compensation, and help vulnerable communities. I couldn't have said it any better than marry that little old lady from Kentucky 
I deeply have appreciated the testimony from our witnesses today and having an opportunity to share a story from Portland, Oregon. Thank you very much, Chairman Davis. Thank you so much, and we will now hear from uh, Representative Suzanne Del Binet from Washington. Thank you very much, um, Chairman Davis, and I also want to thank Chairman Neal for holding today's uh, roundtable. And just thank you to everyone who's spoken, all of you who've told your personal stories. Um, we really appreciate it. That it's incredibly powerful, and that's why this is so important. Um, extending the unemployment insurance benefit is critical to families and uh, to our economy. Um, yesterday's job report showed us that 1.4 million workers filed an unemployment claim just two weeks ago. And um, I got a letter from one of my constituents, Melissa from Redmond. Um, she wanted to share her story because her husband is one of those recently unemployed workers. Um, she says, I'm a public school teacher who works in the only Title I middle school in Bellevue with the most vulnerable kids in the district, low income English learners and kids with disabilities. My husband and I just signed a lease for our house that more than doubled our rent because we were sure we could afford it between his income at a local electronic fabrication company and mine with the Bellevue School District. However, today he was laid off. He is currently filling out the application for unemployment, but I'm scared that it won't be enough to cover our expenses since I just read that the extra unemployment funding will disappear at the end of this week. I am begging you to please fight in Congress for families like mine so that we can stay in our homes and continue to work on getting out of debt. I owe nearly $90,000 in student loans and have benefited greatly from the suspension of payments. I hope I can count on you and my senators to extend both the additional unemployment funding and the suspension of student loan payments while the country continues to fight against COVID-19. Um, that was from Melissa and Melissa, um, we, have, we are fighting for you. That's why we passed the HEROES Act. That's why over two months ago, because we knew how critically this important this was then um, and how important it is that we continue to fight um, to make sure that these benefits are continued. I wanna thank you for allowing me to share your story with everyone and break to light that families like yours are doing everything right and need help um, to expand in unemployment That's right now um, to help get by. So thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you so much. And now we will hear from uh... Representative Linda Sanchez from California. Hi, good morning. If you can give me just a minute, I'm trying to um, get myself organized here. Um, I just came off the floor um, for votes, so I am getting myself together here. Ah. So, Chairman Davis, I want to begin by really thanking you for the opportunity to focus on the millions of families that really need us to extend the $600 federal supplemental if, um, now. They can't wait. And I also want to thank all of the brave witnesses that we have had who joined us to share their experience and what that money means to them. It's been two and a half months since the House passed the HEROES Act to extend the $600 supplement. And my constituents and families across the country are already drowning. It's past time for the Senate to act and the president to join us in extending this lifeline. Um, now I wanna use the remainder of my time to let my constituents words speak for themselves. Adri we, we sent out a request for folks to write in and tell us what this supplement means to them. And of the many, many, many responses we got, I'm just gonna highlight a few. Adrian from Whittier is 38 years old and he lives with his mother as her caretaker. He lost his job due to the pandemic and he told me that he doesn't know how he will make ends meet and care for his mother now that the federal supplement is gone. Leroy from Bellflower told me that the extra $600 is literally a matter of life and death for him. He wrote, quote, I'm an 80 year old mobile notary and I've suspended my service due to COVID-19. If the federal supplement isn't extended until a vaccine is available to me, I will be forced to reestablish my business and take my chances with this killer virus, end quote. Daryl from Cerritos told me he has worked in the food distribution business for 43 years. 
He lost his sales job in March due to COVID-19. Daryl finally found a job at a pastry shop and was scheduled to start in July. But after dining restrictions were tightened in early July, the job offer was rescinded due to a lack of business. He has been applying to three to four jobs daily and still hasn't found another employment opportunity. Without the extra $600 per week, he and his wife are now having to choose between paying rent or eating and paying other bills. He said they are living in a state of panic. Yvette from Whittier told me that without the extra $600 a week, she will have no choice but to move. She wrote to me, quote, without a job, I am more likely to end up homeless. Who will rent to me without a job? I am 51 and was laid off from my job of eight years. I've applied many, many times for work, but nothing yet. I have not stayed home and watched Netflix all day. I've been watching my grandkids with the schools closed. Without the $600 a week, I will no longer afford to pay my cell phone, which I need for callbacks or internet to apply for jobs online. Those are just a few of the countless and heartbreaking reports I've received directly from my constituents. They will only get worse the longer we fail to act. The Senate has been derelict in its duty and it must act. I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you again. Thank you, Linda. And now we will hear from Representative Gwen Moore from Wisconsin. Gwen? All right, I'm here. I mute myself. Uh, 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 uh. Just a second. Oh, okay. I'm un I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm so sorry, uh, Mr. Chair. I uh, I just want to thank you all for <laughs> Mr. Chairman for having this uh, particular hearing. And with regard to all of our witnesses, uh, I feel like I, I I know you all and your stories. <clears throat> I I know several people who. Uh, who, uh, whose stories sound uh, almost exactly uh, the, the same stories that you have. You know, I'm Congresswoman Gwen Moore, and you know, through no fault of, of, of your own, all of you have found yourself uh, in this predicament, and I'm so pleased that we're talking about it uh, today. You know, Malika, Nora, Jacqueline, uh, Mary, Artavia, Alan, Allegra, I feel like I know you all personally. And Mary, I just want to correct you to say that you did not step down when you decided to stay at home and take care of your ailing parents and your son. That was not a step down. And I'm hoping at some point we're going to deal with this on, on a broader basis and really provide recognize the work that people do when they are caretakers in their home and really expand their un, uh, uh, earned income tax credit to cover them. Um, but, you know, if we don't provide people with this extra $600 a month here in the state of Wisconsin, our unemployment benefits will shrink by 67%. Uh, and that extra money is the difference, I think, in people uh, being put on the street. According to the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Department, they have such a huge backlog of eviction notices waiting to execute. And of course, those uh, protections have expired, despite the fact that we provided $100 billion to stop them. And despite the fact as many of my colleagues have already pointed out, we passed the HEROES Act, I believe, in May, um, because we uh, were not in denial about what, what uh, I think economists are soon gonna call uh, a depression. We have not seen uh, economic indicators this bad since the Great Depression. Uh, and this $600, uh, uh, a week um, is uh, for Republicans to say, uh, well, you know, let them eat cake um, uh, as they set, sit there and fiddle and quibble uh, over whether or not we should give these folks nothing, or whether we should give them $200.
to Representative Judy Chu from California. Thank you, Chairman Davis. Well, I am so moved by the stories that I've heard today. You've shown us what it means to have uh, the worry and anxiety um, if you are unable to get the $600 federal pandemic unemployment compensation. Um, you've faced this pandemic uh, and through no fault of you, your own, you've lost uh, your job. The $600 clearly has been a lifeline. And it, it is like the stories that I'm hearing in my district in Pasadena, California. Uh, Damien Tong lives in that district, in my district. He and his wife have two children and they owned a business in the private party and corporate events industry. Damien was also employed as a non-emergency medical ambulance driver. But because of the pandemic, Damien has lost both his business and his job as a driver. Like so many others, this happened through no fault of his own and is unlikely either of these jobs will be available to him in the near future as Southern California continues to be a hot spot of the virus. He wrote me to say that the $600 per week pandemic assistance is so crucial right now to his family. And unfortunately, he's un unable to collect his full unemployment as a lot of his business involved contract work, which is not currently calculated in his unemployment benefits. Uh, but he wanted to make Congress know that regular hardworking people are struggling and need our representatives to push for an extension and a continuation of the $600 pandemic relief. Not only that, we need to make sure that people like Damien who are self-employed or um, perform contract work can receive their full unemployment benefits just like wage workers. I also heard from my constituent, Mary Moldar, a resident of Pasadena and also a teacher and a parent. She worked at a nonprofit nursery school that's closed its doors due to the COVID-19 pandemic. For the first time in 26 years that she's been in the workforce, she is filing for unemployment in September, 2020. She implored us to extend the $600 per week unemployment stimulus. So I urge my colleagues across the aisle and in the Senate to think about people like Damien and Mary and so many others just like them across the country. The virus doesn't care if you're a Republican or Democrat and hard working Americans everywhere are desperately relying on the supplemental unemployment insurance benefits because they just cannot go back to work. We must extend these payments for the millions of people who cannot make ends meet without them. Letting these benefits lapse means leaving people like Damien and Mary and so many of our witnesses that we heard today behind. Thank you and I yield back. Thank you, Judy. And now we'll hear from Representative Dan Kildee from Flint, Michigan. Thank you, uh, Chairman Davis, for your leadership on this issue. And obviously you and Chairman Neal have been leading on this. And it's something that we all understand much more completely as a result of the important stories that we've heard today. So for those of you who told your stories, thank you so much. It does put a human face on this issue, which is absolutely critical. Two months ago, more than two months ago, House Democrats passed our bill. They don't just talk about this. We actually passed legislation to extend these unemployment benefits into 2021. Unfortunately, Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republicans simply haven't shown up for work to do their job. They wanna have a debate about this, but they haven't done the work that the United States Senate is tasked with and if they have a different idea as to how they want to handle unemployment, they should have the will to put it in writing, take it to the floor, and see if they can get the votes. They haven't done that. We have. Their idea, however, is that somehow this benefit should be reduced to $200. And that at some point in time, people should be able to get 70% of their replacement wages. Can they pay 70% of their rent? 
Can they pay the grocery store 70% of the price of the groceries that they have to purchase? Can they get by on 70% of a life? No fault of their own. People have lost their jobs. Listen to these stories. I plead with Republicans in the Senate, in the House. You have constituents just like the people that we've heard from today. Listen to their stories. And if you can't be moved by that, first of all, I think there's something wrong with you. If you can't be moved by these stories, at least consider the implications to the whole economy that the loss of the support to our economy that comes from the unemployment benefit will mean. Unemployment will go up. The economy, which is just being held together, is largely being held together because we've had these benefits available. And I represent people who are in the same position. And I'm going to just share a couple of these stories. After my office helped Shannon from Bay City receive her unemployment benefits, including the $600 back benefit, she told me, quote, now we can pay our bills without falling behind. This is truly hard for everyone. Kathy from my hometown of Flint wrote, quote, I am writing to give you some perspective as you work on this new stimulus package. We just received our last $600 benefit. My husband is a self-employed musician who works out of Detroit. Before the pandemic, he was making around 2,000 a month, working small jobs to fill in the gaps during the week. Since all bars are closed and we can't gather in large group, groups, all of his jobs for the year are canceled or rebooked for next year. The extra unemployment was a godsend. She said that they have a 42-year-old daughter who is severely multiply impaired. This worked for us. And she worked day, he worked nights and weekends, so they didn't have to have a caregiver. They won't survive without our help. They've deferred their house payments for three months, but those are now, now due. Please consider those in the entertainment industry and realize that most will not get work this year due to the recent rise in COVID cases. $120 a week before taxes is much. The point that she makes is that there are jobs for them to go back to this insult to the American worker that people are choosing unemployment over work is not true. And we see the data that shows that. Finally, Jenny from Flint said, because of the pandemic and the closures and slow opening of our major corporations in Michigan, my job is still not allowed. I go into our major corporations through preventative medical screening. Since most of their employees are still working from home, I'm not working. My unemployment from Michigan doesn't come to 25% of what I make. My family depends on the extra $600. I would go back to work if I could, but I cannot. I am not allowed to. Please get the government, government to get this extension of $600. These are real stories. These are real people. This is not a hoax. This is not fantasy. We have to act. The House has. We implore the Senate to get a clue and listen to your constituents like we are. And if you do, you will act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership on this. And I yield back my time. Thank you, Dan. And let me just remind us that we do have votes taking place simultaneously. And we want to try and get everybody in before our time runs out. And now we're pleased to hear from Representative Brendan Boyle from Pennsylvania. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Davis. And just uh, wanted to point out and thank the previous speaker, Congressman Kildee, for his legislation, which I co-sponsor, which would strengthen these benefits and I think is, is vitally important. Um, I also uh, have to commend the, the folks that we heard from powerful, real stories. And I just encourage all of you to please keep speaking out. Sometimes, um, and this is an observation that I've had for the 12 years of office now, sometimes ordinary citizens don't realize just how much of a platform they have. Uh, in some ways, actually have more of a megaphone than elected officials. Because when it comes to a situation like this, People sometimes, those of us in elective office, be dismissed as somehow just quote-unquote politicians or part of a political game. 
those of you who are being affected by this issue, who will be uh, absolutely devastated by a cut or an elimination in the extra unemployment benefits, frankly, you have more credibility uh, than we do. And so I urge you to please continue to speak out on the urgency of this. I also want to push back in very strong terms against the fallacy of false equivalency. I was already seeing it online last night and doing a little of my own pushing back, where some folks in the mainstream media will write the easy article that both sides are failing to approve this. Or that Congress, as an institution, hasn't gotten it done. Intellectually dishonest. Two and a half months ago, the House of Representatives, with every single Democratic vote, approved this extension of unemployment insurance, as well as trillions of dollars of other sort of assistance to ensure that our state and local workers aren't now facing layoffs, as well as many other provisions. Two and a half months ago, May 15th, since then, the Senate has done absolutely nothing. We do know that there are uh, many members of the Senate GOP caucus who have openly said they believe government has already done too much and completely oppose doing anything further. We saw in the data that was released yesterday the worst quarterly drop in American history. That is with this extra bump up in unemployment insurance. Just imagine what is going to, God forbid, now happen, beginning from August 1st and going on. So uh, this is something that I am completely passionate about. I know people in my own community in Philadelphia, in North and Northeast Philly, who are just barely hanging on as it is. And now this will be, for them, absolutely devastating um, that the Senate Republicans have refused to act and this White House has refused to act. We must continue to fight this fight um, because lives are, are at stake. So I thank all of you, the witnesses, and encourage you to please keep it up, speak out, let your friends and family know what is really going on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Brendan. Now we're here from uh, Representative Dunn from Virginia. Chairman Davis, thank you very much for holding this hearing and thank you to Chairman Neal. I just want to shout out to Tia, Jacqueline, Cassandra, Artavia, Nora, Mary, Alan, Allegra, and Magdalena for having the courage to come and speak before us, before a national audience and tell your stories. That's not an easy thing to do, but this is by far the most important issue before Congress right now. It is deeply immoral it is tragically wrong that the Senate has refused to extend unemployment benefits and, in fact, fly home for the weekend, leaving millions of Americans in dire situations. Let me, in my brief time, just read about my constituents in Northern Virginia. Quote, I'm a 79-year-old, a Navy veteran who lost my job in March. I'm having a hard time competing for a good job in the middle of this pandemic. I need the $600 a week benefit to meet my needs. Women in Arlington writes, the only way I can contribute to help support my family and keep us above water is for the extra $600 a week. I'm not begging, I'm not just asking you to continue the extra 600, I'm begging you. Without the money, I cannot cover the mortgage and keep food on the table. Now, Xander Woman writes, quote, I am currently furloughed due to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic and have been since April 7th. I'm currently able to pay my rent and other expenses as well as afford groceries, and support local restaurants. However, I will not be able to do that once the additional $600 expires. Andrea and Alexandria writes, we are not wealthy people. We do not spend a lot. We work hard and we have a daughter with chronic respiratory disease, so we are high risk. The state level max unemployment without the $600 will cripple our finances. And a young woman in Alexandria writes, I've been applying for jobs, taking advantage of free class offerings at my college and trying to stay hopeful that I could return to my previous job, I have no hope anymore. I have to live with what is now the fact that my country does not care how hard I work, whether I can afford basic care needs and afford a roof over my head. 
I want you to know that there are people like myself who are about to lose everything they work so hard for. Their credit will be ruined. They will be homeless. They will starve. They will die from easily manageable illnesses. And worst of all, they will blame themselves as though they have somehow failed. No, it is the Congress, it is the Mitch McConnell Senate that will have failed. The only way to help them is for Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republicans to come back and pass extensive unemployment benefits at humane levels. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Don. And now we will hear from Representative Dwight Evans from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm grateful that for this opportunity to share my constituents' stories that show the critical need to extend the federal unemployment benefits, a lifeline for families in my district. I called the office between five, 300 to 500 times during the only received business. I'm 63 years old and my high blood pressure medication. At this point, I'm financially incapable of paying for it. I'm uninsured and can't pay for COBRA, rent, car insurance, or food. I'm becoming destitute. Please help me get the UNI extension. I am personally furloughed until October, but I work in the travel industry. So there's a very good chance that I will be furloughed until the end of the year. I do get unemployment, but it's literally half of my pay. Plus the holidays are going to be coming up and nobody wants their children to be disappointed. If the $600 per week is taken away, there's a good chance people are going to be so desperate that they could turn ugly because we can't survive. Please help our city weather the storm. We are already scared about the virus. Please don't make us choose between eating and paying bills. We are worried about financial stability during this difficult time if we are unable to receive this check. Currently, my husband has only been back to work one day a week. Please, please support this need to extend. He also is worried about the safety of his job, being in close proximity to large groups of children. We're concerned about the health of my two-year-old daughter who has medical complications, do not want to risk the life. Please let us know about help us in any way. I am currently unemployed union stage worker who has found his whole life turned upside down. I've had to scramble to take money out of my retirement fund, cripple once promising future, just to make sure I can support my ex-wife and our children, pay the mortgage and my house in which they reside, pay rent at my current residence, and help with food and other costs at both houses. Without this extra $600 a week, I fear I will share behind, behind putting multifamilies at risk. Mr. Chairman and Chairman Neal, I thank both of you, and I thank you especially, Mr. Davis, for allowing us to heighten the concern that is out there. Through the voice of these people, they are speaking for all of us. So I join you, uh, Mr. Davis, in fighting for this extension. We need it, and we need it now. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Representative Evans. And now we will hear from my colleague from Illinois, Representative Brad Schneider. Thank you, Chairman Davis, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, you hosting this roundtable and to our panelists for your, you sharing uh, your perspectives and experiences. I know how hard it is. I can't imagine how hard it is, actually, and I can't tell you how grateful I am uh, for you uh, bringing your voices forward to humanize the stories of unemployment in the current pandemic. The HEROES Act clearly articulated a plan to extend emergency um, unemployment benefits through January. The House passed the bill nearly three or nearly three months ago, 80 days ago, for Mitch McConnell's Senate to engage and work with us to help in struggling Americans. Sadly, the Senate has gone on to recess, has gone home for the weekend, and they their proposals fail to adequately grapple with our problems. Their proposals cut unemployment insurance as more pe people continue to lose their jobs with no work to return to. 
The National Association of State Workforce Agencies says that the Senate proposed unemployment scheme would take months to implement. The bottom line is that Americans who have been sidelined due to this virus do not have months to wait. The last payment for federal pandemic unemployment compensation in Illinois went out last Saturday. And if the Senate continues to fail to act, we will see more children go hungry, more families fail to pay rent, and the nation's economy contract further. It's needless suffering at the hands of failed leadership in the Senate. I appreciate all of the panelists sharing their stories, but let me highlight two stories from my, my district um, that will uh, expand on the experience. So the first is from Michael Ways of Libertyville, who reminds us that no matter how badly Mitch McConnell wants him to return to work, there's simply no gatherings for him to go to. My name is Michael Ways, and I'm from Libertyville, Illinois. I've been in the live concert industry for 30 years. Without the ability for people to gather, this industry is completely gone. Myself and hundreds of other sound and lighting technicians have zero work. Our hands are tied until it is safe to gather again. Most folks in this industry do not have insurance or 401ks. Without the $600 benefit, many will have to choose between food and insurance before paying their bills. For the record, whoever is telling folks the extra money is keeping us from working couldn't be further from the truth. All of my fellow technicians just want to get back to work. None of them want to stay home. I implore you to extend this benefit at least until the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And now let me play from Joy Perlman in Wheeling. My name is Joy Perlman from Wheeling, Illinois. I had a very successful career prior to COVID. And the extra $600 is less than half of what I was making. It's a lifeline right now. My health insurance premium alone is $875 a month. Just one of my inhalers is $375 additional. I want nothing more than to be able to go back to my career and continually am looking for extra ways to earn money from home where it's safe until COVID is over. Keep fighting for us, please. We need you. Thanks, Joy. I have so many more recordings, letters, calls to my office from people in my district sharing stories like these. To Joy, to Michael, to everyone who shared their story today, thank you for doing so. I know you are counting on this benefit. Your stories are making a difference, and please know that. Thank you, Brad. And now we will hear from Representative Jimmy Panetta from California. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Davis, and thank you, uh, obviously, to Chairman Neal for holding this hearing, holding this roundtable hearing, allowing us to hear from Real Table and allowing for you to hear from our constituents about the impact this benefit has had on literally all of our lives and across all of this country uh, in areas that uh, are, are, are affordable in areas like mine that can be very unaffordable as well. Look, I think we know that throughout this pandemic, this administration has absolutely failed to put forward a unified strategy, a national unified strategy. So we've been left with employing a strategy, what I have been terming as federally funded, state mandated, and locally executed. Now, federally, Congress played its part. We did our job. We passed the CARES Act, which provided a critical wage replacement for all Americans who have lost their jobs at record rates. Now, based on the data, I, I believe it's clear. The federal pandemic unemployment compensation has helped families, help them stay put in their homes, help them pay their bills, and help them put food on their table. The massive fiscal support we provided proved very effective. It even, even as a jobless rate reached its highest level since the depression, household incomes were 12% above their level a year earlier. Remarkably, the poverty rate fell since the start of this year. However, we know, as we've heard on this roundtable, our economy is fragile due to this pandemic and letting the extension lapse when unemployment still exceeds 10% is absolutely cruel. So it is important that we come to an agreement on this next package and extend these benefits. When we know there are concerns, we've heard about it, about the generosity of the benefits or the effects of small business and the effects on small businesses but we cannot pull the rug out underneath these families by letting these benefits expire, and we cannot slash them by two thirds. 
The data shows, as our, and as our witnesses have confirmed, this wage replacement benefit is just too valuable at a time when our economy and our constituents are way too vulnerable. Constituents like Martin from Marina, who says, please extend the unemployment benefit. Living in California is tough enough during this time. The only thing keeping me afloat is the extra $600 a week. Anything less will make us homeless. David from Pacific Grove, just wanting to push for the unemployment benefits. I'm a 58-year-old who has spent his career in the food and beverage and as a business owner as well. My weekly benefits are $197 a week since my work in catering was a private contractor and my seven years working at a local church did not count towards my unemployment benefits since religious organizations do not pay into it. Getting work and catering is impossible and restaurant work is minimal. I need that additional money just to pay bills. Thank you. And then lastly, from Kathleen in Watsonville, it's been very important that the extra unemployment benefits be continued through the year. I'm self-employed and unable to resume due to the COVID-19. The cost of living is high here on the Central Coast of California, and I rely heavily on unemployment for the rest of my time in my life. Thus, the extra money being circulated and helping the economy is important. Please do what you can to make sure this passes with the next stimulus. Thank you. Look, we are going to do what we can. We're going to continue to fight for all of you who were courageous enough to be on this call as we continue to fight for all of our constituents. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. And uh, let me just ask if uh, Dr. Gomez is back. If not, I think he went to vote. And now it's my pleasure to hear from Representative Tom Sousey from uh, New York, and he's last, but not least, by any stretch of imagination, Representative South. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, this is our first formal Ways and Means gathering uh, since we uh, said goodbye to our, our colleague who also served on Ways and Means as the chairman of the Oversight Committee, uh, John Lewis. I'm sure everyone on this call, our witnesses especially, uh, saw uh, his going home ceremony and different reports about it with the different speeches that people made. And I'm thinking of him during this hearing. Uh, I listened to all of the, the witnesses in the beginning. I had, we had to do some votes. I had to get off for a bit. Uh, but I know that he would say to each of you, thank you so much uh, for your courage. And thank you for participating here today to try to educate not only us, but our fellow Americans, about how important uh, this benefit is. And he'd say that uh, he loves all of you, and I love all of you as well. And uh, we care about you, and uh, we can't add anything to, your, to what you've said. We recognize that uh, I've listened to your stories about your children and about concerns about sickness and about your financial concerns, and uh, we're so grateful to you for sharing those stories with us. And we're going to do everything we can uh, to fight for you. Uh, and we appreciate uh, you helping us to educate our colleagues and the rest of the country about how there are hardworking people uh, who really are trying to do the right thing, who are worried about their own health, are worried about their children's health, are worried about their parents' health that are facing tough times, paying their normal bills. Uh, many of you making much less money from this unemployment insurance, which we like to call wage replacement, uh, than you were making before. Uh, and that, you know, it's not about people trying to game the system. It's about people facing a horrible, tragic pandemic, and now facing incredible financial and health hardships. So. We care about you, uh, we love you, and we're gonna keep on uh, speaking out, standing up for all of you. So thanks so much to all of you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to Chairman Neal for uh, putting this together. We're very grateful to him for his leadership. Thanks so much. And thank you so much. And I note that uh, Representative Gomez did in fact get back. And now Representative Gomez, we will come to you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I just want to say I, I appreciate 
all your stories um, and your and your experiences and your personal telling. And the reason why is that oftentimes in Congress and oftentimes in, when people are discussing policies, they, they discuss it in a very sterilized way, right? That, that people are not at the other end of those policies. And um, I know what you're going through. I, I've been through that myself when I was, um, back in 2004, I finished a job and I was getting another job and my father got sick with pancreatic cancer and I had to take time off uh, to take care of him and help my mother. And I didn't work for almost a year and I cleared out my 401k. Um, and then I you know, got a, one little small contract that maybe came me afloat, but there was, a, there was a point where I tried to pull out $20 from my uh, ATM and I didn't have even $20 to pull out. And that was the worst feeling I've, I've ever had, not even 20 bucks, right? You're, so it's, um, and it messes with you me mentally, it messes with you, um, you know, emotionally, um, that, you know, am I gonna be able to dig out of this, um, this place that I'm in? And that money is, um, the $600 a week is, is huge. Um, it not only gives you hope, but it also helps pay for a roof over your head, you know, uh, food on the table, make sure that you can continue um, living. So I know that all too well. I was lucky um, that I could stay at my parents' house and even though it was, it was full, I slept in the garage, right? We may do. Um, not everybody's that lucky, right? They end up maybe going onto the streets, maybe they go into a homo shelter, um, but everybody's not as lucky as I was. Um, a garage is better than, than outside. Um, so we need to continue pushing these, these stories because it's, it's about the people on the other end of this policy. The $600 is for all of you. Um, there are stories in my district, just like yours, where I had a, a uh, actor who was making a decent living, but you know these actors go from shift to shift to shift, program to program. And he lost his job because of the pandemic, because they're not filming anymore. Um, he's about uh, $600 a week to make ends meet. And he's afraid that he's not gonna be able to do it, right? Um, so I want to make sure that we, we get these stories out and people understand that what that $600 means and, and your stories are, are powerful. Um, we need to keep make, making sure that the Republicans know about it. Um, they had no problem passing you know, a tax cut worth $3 trillion that didn't pay for itself several years ago. But all of a sudden, when they're thinking about giving $600 a week to, to workers, right? then all of a sudden it's an issue. They have no problem with talking about the virtue of the American worker, how, how great they are, how you know, pro, pro, uh, productivity increases under the American worker, how entrepreneurial they are. But yet, when all of a sudden they're saying the $600 creates a disincentive, they're basically calling all American workers lazy. And I know American workers aren't lazy, right? They're the hardest workers around, but when they need help, they need help. Plain and simple. Um, so we're going to keep uh, pushing. And if the, the Republicans only care about the macro, you know, the economy is doing well, it's not doing well instead of the individual, well, cut back on the $600 a week and then the macro is going to feel it desperately. We have the worst con uh, contraction of the U.S. economy in its history. So imagine all of a sudden that, you know, millions of workers don't have at $600 extra a week, what kind of contraction you're gonna face in the economy. And the workers who think that they are safe from this pandemic or safe from the economic fallout will also begin to feel the pain because it will not only um, go down the economic ladder, but also go up the economic ladder. Uh, that's what they tend um, to fail to realize. So thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for letting me go a little over um, it's something that we all deeply feel, and we're gonna keep we're gonna keep pushing until this is extended. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you so much, and let me just tell you, listening to what you had to say was worth going over a little bit. I thank you for your very compelling remarks, 
And I'm going to ask each one of our witnesses who are still left, if you had one word to say to us, uh, what would it be? Alan, why don't we start with you? Uh, I th thank you, by the way, again, for all of your uh, support. But the one word would be please. Please. Help. Please. All right. And uh, Allegra? My one word would be resilience. Cassandra? Oh, we just need to have. Sorry, am I un now? Yes. Okay. Um, my two words, but it was just to help us. We need it. Help. All right. <laughs> Jacqueline? One word would be act now. Act now? Yes. Mary? I have never been able to only say one word in my entire life. This is not okay with me. Um, <laughs> I will be very brief, however. The mental health aspect of this is going to form a ripple that will last generations between our children and the desperation of their parents through this pandemic. And, and I have grave concerns for all of us, not just the people in charge and not just those of us that are needy, but everybody together. And uh, I was pretending I was in um, in Mr. Lewis's seat today and, and glad that even though my skin color is very white, uh, he has emboldened me to stand up and say, help, 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 help. All right, thank you, Melencia. In the union concert business and this is the first time i'm asking the government to help me otherwise me and my, my child will be homeless all right thank you and tia ferguson be righteous all right well let me just thank each and every one of you uh, you have been so impactful you 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 have enlightened us and you have given us our marching orders i want to thank all of the members who participated and uh did i miss anybody uh octavia nora well i think she may have gone <laughs> no i'm here i'm here all right uh, Representative Dana Davis, I'm here. I, I was going to say, um, I really thought about it, and I'm like, it's really about service. Let's not forget that these are public service positions, and so that Our, requires compassion of the American people. We will serve humanity. Uh, Nora? All right. Yes, Go ahead. Thank you so much. And um, our thoughts and prayers are with everyone right now, you know, uh, during the transition of um, Representative Lewis. He was uh, much loved and dear to us here. He came and spoke to my son's second grade class for their civil rights project in the second grade. And it will always be a very cherished memory for us that um, he took the time to come and speak. All right, then we want to thank each and every one of you for taking time from whatever else it is that you could have been doing, but I can't think of anything that would have been more important. I want to thank all of the members who participated. And of course, we want to thank Chairman Neal for his creative leadership and bringing us together. You know, as I listened to all of the testimonies, as I heard all of the members speak, I couldn't be reminded of but one thing, and that is that every man's death diminishes me. And I can tell you that those of us who are Democrats in this House and in this Senate, we know for whom the bells toll. 
they told for each and every one of us, we've got your back. We will stand with you and we will fight for you until justice is done. Thank you so much. Have a good weekend and we'll see you next week somewhere on the firing line and on the battlefield for justice. Have a good day and thanks again.